to give you thanks, glory, and for your mercy, patience, and for your forgiveness, and your love. Lord Jesus, we thank you for keeping your hands around us, 
keeping your hedge of protection around us and keeping us safe from the virus and other diseases. Thank you for helping us to be obedient to you and to the doctors who you are advising us to follow. Lord, wrap your arms around your children. Keep us as we go through this dangerous time. Oh God, we ask you to keep our children safe as they go back into the schools. Keep our teachers and our parents. Give them wisdom and give them knowledge about your word. Oh God, we ask you to endow our leaders in government to make Christian decisions, not just political decisions. We thank you, oh God, for what you're doing in our lives right now. We thank you and we praise you. We glorify your holy name. We magnify you, oh God, and we thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our prayer from morning to night. Oh God, we walk around and we keep you in our, in our mind, in our hearts, in everything that we do. We keep you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our and answering our prayer. These and other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. And for your sake, amen and amen. Good morning, good morning, church. I am here to bring you your announcements for today. But before I get to that, I just want to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. We are so glad to see you here virtually. Again, we can't wait to hug you and love all on you. But until then, I give you a good morning and a hallelujah from a distance. So let's get started with our announcements. Please bring your hearts and please be important of our announcements. First, we would like a we would like to address that our financial reports for August 2020 are in the library in the church. Again, our treasurer would like to let us know that the August 2020 financial reports are in the library in the church. Please make sure you schedule your time accordingly. Um, to come and pick up your August 2020 financial reports. I am quiet, simply blessed beyond belief by the kind, loving, and considerate people in my life. I appreciate you more than words can say to the prayer ministry from George Walker with infinite love. Thank you. Thank you. Your kindness means so much to me. I would like to thank too. I would like to thank you for the flowers and the prayers of during the time of the passing of my father, Herbert H. Natil, on August 13th of 2020. Angela Natil and family says thank you. Please make sure you mark your calendars again. Our treasurer would like us to know that the August 2020 financial reports are located in the library. We will now have our scripture by Sister Bruce Speed, and then we'll have our music selection by Pastor Richardson, and of course, the man of the house, our shepherd, Reverend Frazier, will be here to deliver the word. Thank you. Good morning. Our scripture text this morning will be coming from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 12, and I will be reading from the New International Version. That is 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 12, and it reads, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath and the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there, gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord 
your God lives, she replied. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Jesus will. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, say, Jesus will. Yes, I know that he will. I'm a witness that he will. Truly, again, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of this worship experience. And we trust that God will bless you in a special way as you sit in the comforts of your home, as you cruise in the, in the comforts of your car, wherever you may be. It is our prayer that God will reach you through this message. And so now, if you'd be so kind as to turn with us to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to thank Sister Jasmine and all of our worship participants who made this service possible by sharing and their gifts and embraces. And we're always grateful for them. none other than the Reverend Dr. David Richardson. David, he's a, he's a musician. Call David in the Bible. I always think about that musical talent and how it must have just jumped off the page of the Holy Bit, Pastor David, and landed on you. Amen. We thank God for you on this day. If you'll be so kind as to turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, verses, verse 12. In fact, I want to put the spotlight on verse 12. And while you're turning, we solicit your prayers for several of our members who are sick and shut in. Certainly want to be in prayer for Sister Brenda Adams and for Angela Natil and even for Miss Serta, who all three of them have been hospitalized. And I know that um, Sister Adams has been released home, but Angela, as well as Miss Serta, had a procedure done on yesterday. And we want to keep them lifted in our prayers, as well as Sister Joyce Miller, who was hospitalized and now she's back um, at the nursing home resting in her. Prayers continue to be with her. And then we also heard, and I spoke to Brother Bird on yesterday that his auntie, auntie, um, his auntie, I call her mother auntie, because she's 102 years old, getting ready to turn 102 years old on the next month. And incidentally, let me announce to you, please take out your pen and a piece of paper when I announce to you that on Saturday, on this coming Saturday, at 9.30, in honor of Mother Bradley, we'll be making a drive-by to celebrate her 100th birthday. And so we're asking all members to come up to the church and remain in your cars at 9.30, and then we will make our journey, our parade, our convoy over to Miss Bradley to celebrate her, this landmark of achievement. Longevity has its place, and we thank God for her, as well as for Mother Bird, who will turn next month 102 years old. And I've told Brother Bird, we're driving out there too. We're going to be the drive-by celebrating church. Amen, somebody. And so please put that on your calendar. Next, on this Saturday coming at 9.30, right here at the church, we want to see you as we make our journey over to celebrate the 100th birthday of Mother Bradley. But for now, if you be so kind, as the turn, and while I'm talking about drive-bys, sandwiched in between um, Mother Bradley and Mother Bird, we want you to drive by the pole this November, the first week, first Tuesday in November. Please don't get amnesia. Wake up and drive somebody, drive yourself to the pole. Amen. Make your vote count and let your voice be heard. We have too much at stake for you to sit at home and miss this monumental moment. I want to encourage you, I want to be in prayer for you that you would go to the pole and, and make your vote count. Amen, somebody? Amen, amen. But for now, for now, I'm sorry. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 12. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 12. Those of you who have your Bibles, keep your Bibles open as we journey through this text together. First Kings chapter 17 with the spotlight on verse 12. We find these words. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm getting, I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it. And
and die, the woman said. Let me read that. And then, then this is the widow talking, the widow from Zarah. She says in verse 12 to the preacher, to the prophet Elijah, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied. I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug, she said. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. This mother was at the end of her rope. And that's what I want to talk about in this fourth installment of this series, when you reach the end of your rope. I'm going to put a smile on your face and be seated at home next to someone you love. Amen. Make sure you love them. If you plan to make heaven your home, you grant the love. Amen. You can be seated in the comfort of your home, but you got to love everybody. Jesus said, even love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. So say to him, say to him, when you reach the end of your rope, when you reach the end of your rope, will you bow your heads with me as we pray together? Lord, once again, we bow before you and before your throne of grace. You not only brought us thus far along the way, O oh God, but you brought us all of the way. You continue to hold our hands as we walk this race. Thank you for your sustaining power and your ever supplying grace. Thank you for being our God and for allowing us to be your children. But you continue to prove yourself to us over and over again just how much you care for us. You continue to provide and you continue to protect. Thank you for what you've done. We give you praise, we give you glory and honor. And oh God, for all those names that we have mentioned this morning, station your angels by their side. Help them to feel your power and presence moving right now in their circumstance, in their situation. Help them to know, God, that they're not alone and that you promised to be with us always, even through such a time as this. Thank you for our church families and what you're doing in our midst. Continue to sustain each and every one of our members, oh God, and wherever the gospel is being preached, we want your word to go forth, to impact hearts, and to change lives. Have thine own way, Jesus. And as we continue to worship you this morning, we just ask that you let your spirit fall fresh upon us. Somebody needs to hear from you today, oh God. Somebody needs a word of help, a word of healing, and a word of hope. And we know that if you just, if you just speak it, everything will be all right. Take now these words and make them down. Let your voice be heard and not mind. We ask it all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And the fourth and final installment under the investigatory theme that we've shared now for several weeks now, we have gleaned several lessons about what to do when you reach the end of your room. And for the past several weeks, we have been looking and been on a biblical fact-finding study, a series of sermons where we learned in part one and we used the scriptural lens in this same book, but different chapter of 1 Kings, several lessons we learned after we heard Elijah pray and tell God, it is enough, O oh God, I, I can't take it anymore. The Bible says that Elijah prayed and then he laid. He, he prayed, Lord, I, I can't stand it. He prayed and then he laid down and went to sleep. But he learned and we saw that, that God still heard and answered his prayer. God hears and God answers all of our prayers. One songwriter said he will hear your faintest cry and he will what? Answer by and by all prayers are heard and all prayers are answered. But always remember that just because God doesn't answer your prayer in the affirmative, it does not mean that the prayer went unanswered. Don't stop walking around with your head hung down, equating an ungranted petition to mean an unanswered prayer. But, but please don't get me wrong. Now listen, God does answer our prayers. But, but that doesn't mean that when God answers, he's going to give us 
what we want. God answers prayer and God honors prayer not based on what we want, but based on what we need. The Bible says he knows what we need, what? Even before we ask. And some of the stuff that we ask God for, we really don't need. Can I buy an amen right about now? In fact, I shared with you a few weeks ago that you ought to thank God for not giving you what you want, huh? But instead, he gave you what you need, huh? Isn't that a good God? Hmm? Because had he given us what we wanted, we would have ended up messing ourselves up and messing a whole boatload of other folk up. But seriously, have you ever looked back over your life and thank God for the stuff that he didn't give you, huh? Because he just, because you asked for it. And then some of us, some of us, some of us, I said some of us. Look at the person next to you say some of us. When we don't like the answer that God gives us, we prefer to go get us a what? A second opinion. Why? Why? Because we want us a God that caters to our wants instead of a God who ushers in our needs. We, we also learn in part two that many times God has to erase the faith that we have in ourselves in order to expand the faith that we ought to have in him. And we learn that there will come a point in your faith development when God will bring you to a place in your life to get you to recognize your inability to meet your own needs and to see his ability to meet your every need. What did the songwriter say? All I have needed, thou hand hath provided. And, and speaking of provision, we saw on last week in part three when the disciples, those who were close to him, those who claimed his name, and they found themselves at the end of their road. They found out that their greatest threat was not physical. Their greatest threat was spiritual. Right? It was not that the storm was beating them in their face. No, the storm battered their faith so much so that they said to Jesus, you don't even care about us. They accused the Lord of not caring. They were too busy focusing on the problem and, and too little focus was on the problem solved. Those who followed him, those who were close to him, found out that God was in a storm in your life, sometimes for your correction, sometimes for your provision, and other times for your instruction, just to show you he is who he says he is. They, they even said, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves would obey him. And ultimately we saw that when storms come into our lives, they're not destined to destroy us, but many times they're designed to develop us. I need to say that again. The storms that come into our lives are not destined to destroy us, but they're designed to develop us. God, the same God who sends deliverance is the same God who sends development. And so I've learned, church, I've learned how to thank him for my storms. Because if I never had a storm, I would never know that he's a shelter in the time of a storm. If I never had a problem, I had to learn how to think and bump the problems because if I never had a problem, I would never know that God could solve them. I had to learn how to thank him for walking through the valley because if I never been through the valley, I would never know that he's the lily of the valley. I had to thank him for having to weep that night. Anybody ever had to cry through the night? Well, if I never had to weep, I would never know that weeping may endure for a night. But somebody ought to praise him right now. Joy! is coming in the morning. And, and watch this, watch this. If I never reach the end of my road, I would never know that God works on both ends of the road. Let me say that again, because that's right where we are in this text. If, if I never reach the end of my road, I would never know that God works on both ends of the road. I'm in the text. Look, that is exactly what God is getting ready to teach Elijah. Turn to your neighbor. Tell him, say, God works on both ends of the road. In fact, in fact, scratch that, scratch that. Let me give it to you another way. Tell your neighbor, scratch that. Listen, while you are trying to figure it out on this end, God has already worked it out on the other end. Somebody who's at the end of the road, you need to take some good notes. Now, now before we dive deep into this text, let, let me show you how rich and revealing this text is, how profound and powerful this story is. Look, look, even Jesus, the master teacher, the wonderful counsel, 
look, he who is saved in the divine, look, all the way over into the New, New Testament. I want you to turn over to the New Testament. Jesus even talked about this story. We're coming back to our primary text, but I want you to see this same text that Jesus himself weighed in on. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Look at verses 25 through 26. Look at it. Luke chapter 4. We're coming back to our main text again. I'll be look at it. Luke chapter 4, verses 25 through 26. We, we find these words. Jesus said, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the skies were shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine in the land, verse 26, Jesus said, Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Look, look, what, geez, what is Jesus saying? In fact, write this down. This is another lesson that, that we need to learn. Sometimes God sends us to the most unlikely places to develop some unused potential in our lives. Let me say that again. Sometimes God will send us to some of the most unlikely places to develop some of the unused potential in our lives. Sometimes God has to box us in in order to bring us out. Now, if the master teacher talked and talked about this story, then you might understand why I keep saying that this story has layers and layers of lessons that every child of God needs to learn. It chock full of some tremendous truths that will change your life, transform your life, and put your life on a new trajectory. Now come on back to our text for this morning. Look, look, come on, I'm going to put a spotlight once again on verse 12. Let me show you what the Lord showed me when I spent time in prayer and preparation this week. Look at verse 12 again. Look at it. The woman says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any, any bread. I'm only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil and a, and a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and, and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. This, this mother was at the end of her rope. Now come on back to verse 9. I really wish I could hang out right there and talk about this mother, but I want to spend some time on Elijah. Look at Elijah in verse 9. God told Elijah, look, to go to this place. And here again, this is another one of those instances where God will allow us to reach the end of our rope just to show us he's working on both ends. The same God who sends the storm can also speak peace through the storm. The, the same God who sends Elijah into a no way out of with no way out situation is getting ready to show Elijah that he can still make a way out of no way. And closely related to that lesson is the same lesson we covered a few weeks ago that God will bring us to a place, huh? God will allow us to get to a point on our journey on this pilgrimage where we might not have the resources, where we might not have the revenue to meet our own needs, but God has to demonstrate his ability to meet our every need. In other words, God wants to teach us to totally to trust and depend on him. You see, we will trust God in some things. And like Elijah, we, we weren't ready to trust God in everything. We have to learn how to trust God in everything. And sometimes our faith journey, write this down, will call us to do the unthinkable in order that we might receive the impossible. I think I said something important. I better say that again. Sometimes while on this faith journey, God will call us, our faith will call and challenge us to do the unthinkable in order that we might receive the impossible. If, if you don't hear anything else I've said this morning, in fact, if you haven't heard anything I've said for the past three weeks, let, listen, let me say this again. At times, faith will require you to do the unthinkable in order to receive the impossible. Look at this text. Elijah the prophet, they call him the prophet of courage and confrontation. He, he had to learn how to trust God and to take care of him at his most desperate situations. Somebody can, can, can relate to this text. Somebody can help me finish this sermon right now. Elijah had to trust God to send the ravens to feed him. Elijah had to trust God to supply water using a little brook from Cherub. But then he had to watch God allow his brook, the only source of water he had, 
to dry up before his very eyes. Sure, surely I thought enduring this kind of trial that it counted for something. And, and, I mean, something had to get better for the prophet. But when you look at verse 7 of our text today, back up to verse 7. Look at it. God is trying to teach Elijah a lesson he had not learned while he was at the brook of Cherith. Well, at Cherith, down at the dry brook, God used the end of that rope to teach Elijah lesson number one. He had to reduce Elijah's pride. Hmm? God had to reduce his pride. That, that's what the word cherub means. The brook of cherub means to cut. It means to trim. Huh? At cherub, God had to reduce. God had to trim. God had to cut. God had to choke. God had to prune Eli away Elijah's pride to get Elijah to fulfill and understand his purpose. Huh? And when you look at verse 9, Elijah is called to go to a place called Zarephath. Zarephath means a, a struggle, a smeltering fire. Please know while at the brook of Cherub, the place where God used to reduce Elijah's pride, in verse 9, we see God sending Elijah to Zarephath, the place where God is going to refine, lesson number two, his potential. Come on, say, reduce his pride. Now say, refine his potential. Here, here, Elijah will learn that God, not, not Elijah, calls all the shots. Now God is calling all the shots. You see, God in this text was still working on Elijah. Sometimes God has to melt us before God can mold us. Some, like the songwriter said, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. God is molding somebody right now for his purpose and his plan. Somebody is like a lump of clay sitting on the potter's wheel. Some, Sometimes God has to break us down before he can build us back up. Elijah may have already graduated from Dry Brook University, but God is getting ready to enroll him into Empty Barrel Graduate School. Elijah had to learn how to totally depend on God because there was some stuff waiting on him down the road. At the brook, God reduced Elijah's pride. At Zarephath, God refined Elijah's potential by, by sending him to another painful set of circumstances. And like I used to hear my mother say, she used to say to me, Michael, pain will teach you a lesson that your pride won't let you learn. Somebody ought to say amen. Zarephath, look at it. Zarephath, it is not seen as a place for Elijah's punishment. Zarephath is seen as another phase in Elijah's development. Elijah learned that the things are never like they appear at Zarephath. Look, Elijah learned that God can use the humblest of means to train his children for his glory. At Zarephath, Zarephath was the place that would live up to his name. Elijah learned about a smeltering furnace and, and refinery. He refers to a furnace to which the metal gets so hot that it reduces or empties out all of the impurities. Cherith was a place where Elijah had to be cut off and, and be cut down, reduced. But Zarephath would be the place where Elijah would have to be refined in order that he might regain a different perspective. Some of us are right there right now because there are times in our own lives when it seems like that our trials come back to back to back. It, it seems like that, that there are trials that come after you're done with one trial. Here comes another trial. But listen, God is getting ready to use you for a greater good, but before he can use you, he's got to mold, melt you, and then make you after his will. What did the songwriter say? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and I am, am the clay. Make me and mold me after thy will. While I am waiting, what? Yielded and still. Come on to verse 9 as I make my way to my close. Please notice in verse Nine. Look at this. Don't miss this. Somebody needs to hear this. Look at verse 9. Somebody who feels like you're at the end of your world. Look at verse 9. Notice, notice. Again, Elijah is told to dwell there. To stay there. In other words, to be still. He is told to go to Zarephath and, and, and to stay there until he receives new instructions from the mouth of the Lord. Listen, the Bible teaches that God's times of testing don't come with a timetable or a time limit. Somebody missed that. When you're going through something, God's times of testing don't come with a time limit attached to it. He, he merely sends us into it. 
and he leaves us in it until he finishes. Can I say that again? He will send us into it, leave us in it until he finishes. Sometimes God will allow you to reach the end of your rope in order, lesson number one, to reduce your pride in yourself. Number two, in order to refine the potential that you have. But ultimately, God will order our steps into an unforeseen set of circumstances many times. Lesson number three, to reveal his power. Elijah must have felt like he had been abandoned by God. Have you ever felt that way? It's a terrible feeling. However, God didn't forget about Elijah, and God is not going to forget about you. God knew exactly where Elijah was, and the text says, look at the text, the text says that God had already worked it out. See, while you are still trying to figure it out, listen, God has already worked it out. God will, it, it will is that we wait on him until he does his own timetable. He don't work on our timetable, what? but he's an on-time God. What? Yes, he is. If, if your brook is dried up this morning, I stop by to tell you, don't fear. Like Elijah told the woman, don't fear. Look, God has not forgotten about you. He knows just where you are. And in his own time, he revealed his power. In his own time, he revealed his purpose. In his own time, he revealed his plan for each and every one of our lives, just like he did for Elijah. But you're going to have to learn to wait on him. The Bible says, they that wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Just be still and wait on them. Verse 9, verse 9, I'm through. Look at verse, verse 9. When the Lord does speak to Elijah, I love it. He, he commands him to go to Zarephath. This is a strange command considering the fact that God at times will send us into the worst set of circumstances just to demonstrate that he can and that he will take care of you. Hmm? Look, Zarephath is a Gentile nation. This is a country where Jezebel ruled. It is the land of idolaters. It is a wicked place filled with wicked people. Yet, yeah, that is exactly where the Lord sends his prophet. On top of that, Elijah has to march over 100 miles. It seems like this command of the Lord makes no sense at all. And there are times when the commands of God seem strange. There are times when his commands of God seem harsh. There are times when the commands of God doesn't seem real. However, the real challenge is what God told the prophet next. He told him, Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. Please notice this. You see, in those days, widows were the poorest of the poor. Instead of God telling Elijah, I'm sending you to a widow so that you can take care of her. God said, no, I'm sending you to a widow so that I can show you I'm going to take care of you. Oh, I love this text. Look at it. He will send you to Zarephath where you have no other choice but to look at your life and to look at your circumstances and say, nobody and nothing but a God. I believe there are ancestors who will say, we've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord. Why? Because he's never failed me yet. We, we got to learn to trust God, not for something, but we got to learn to trust him in everything. Our God is a God who works on both ends of the road. He can still make a way out of nowhere. He can still hit a crooked stick with a straight lip. He can still turn midnights into noondays. He can still take a little and make a lot. He can still do what no other power on earth can do. Anybody know what the Lord can do? Are you out there? Do you know that he will take care of you? The Bible says when Jacob and his sons needed food, God provided a Joseph in Egypt. When the children of Israel, the Bible says when in Jericho, God provided a Rahab. When the Hebrews were faced with a Haman, God provided an Esther. When Jesus was on the cross of crucifixion, God provided a resurrection. Somebody knows that the Lord will and that the Lord can take care of you. Somebody said, do not this made. Whatever be tied, God will what? Take care of you. You just hold on. Be strong. March on. And God will take care of you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you face, we serve a God who, who's got all power in his hand. And he got your circumstance. He's got your situation in his hands. You just got to learn like Elijah to trust him, not just on some things, but trust him in everything, and he will 
take care of. We invite you here to lift your eyes. We go with grace, more grace. We say, Lord, you're a good God. You're a promise keeping God. You're a providing God. You're a God who promised never to leave us, not to forsake us. And even as we go through the storms of life, oh God, we know that you sustain life and that you promise that you will speak even to the winds and to the waves and make everything all right. And we just put our hands in your hands. You'll keep us. You'll put a hedge of protection all around us because you love us. We belong to you. And we thank you for what you've done and even for what you're getting ready to do. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen and amen. May God bless you. May God keep you as our prayer. We love you.